everyone and thank you very much for joining the Node.js Configuration Masterclass. Hi, I'm Matteo Collina, co-founder and CTO of Platformatic. Uh, why should you listen to me? Probably you shouldn't verify everything that I say in this class, but I am part of the Node.js Tachica Steering Committee as well as part of the board member of OpenJS and a board member of the OpenJS Foundation created libraries that you probably use every day like Fastify or Pino. I don't know. Um, more importantly, my software runs on your computer. So at this point in time, you have definitely more than one module created by me installed on your machine. So this is uh, absolutely there. OK, so um, what is this all about? It's about storing configuration. So storing configuration, it's, it's what it is. And uh, we are going to talk a little bit about the um, 12 factor apps. What are 12 factor apps? Well, uh, we can go and take a look at this tab and therefore take a look at the, st at the things and to the 12 factor app, 12factor.net. Uh, and these more or less explain how to build an app that scales. So, hey been translated, last updated 2017, been around since forever. So take a look. Um, so basically the, the full point of this is uh, you want to store configuration in the environment. So don't store files um, yeah, on disk. So let's take a look at what it matters. So first of all, what is an environment? Question for all of you. Um, uh, we are talking about everything green. I'm sorry, I can sustain the environment. These are my mountains, by the way. Um, so uh, it's fun. And uh, um, but yeah, let's check Wikipedia. What is a deployment environment? Well, uh, uh, Wikipedia tells me that uh, or ChatGPT. We can ask ChatGPT what is a deployment environment and see if it gives me the same response. Is um, is a computer system? Okay, where code is deployed and executed. What does this mean? Well, it means it's servers. Okay? When we talk about the concept of environment, we are referring to uh, uh, something that it's deployed to. Okay? Generically, the, uh, uh, what we intend when we talk about environments, we have a local environment, which is your box, my, my laptop, okay? and um, development, which is servers. And then uh, we might have an integration environment, and then my, we might have QA testing, and then we have staging, and then we have production. A lot of environments. All of this costs a lot of money, by the way, folks, a lot of money. So, and all the point of having all those environments is they, sh they should be as close as possible to, each to the production so that you can catch bugs, right? Cool. Each environment should have its own configuration and it should be as close as possible to the one of prod. Great. Okay, let's talk about the simplest way to configure a Node.js app. So, uh, and by the way, all the code samples are in this repo, which I created, I think this morning or something like that. I don't know when I did yesterday. Okay, I pushed code yesterday. Um, so it's there, okay, and it has two comments done uh, yesterday and yesterday good okay so you can see when i worked on this stuff so um code examples is available there okay and let's uh take a look so if we go in we can see a bunch of stuff and let me okay so here we have uh let's lo and go inside simple and we have a, a bunch of very simple things to talk about. So, in simple, you have uh, the simplest way to configure a node app. So, reading a config file as um, and then parsing it as a JSON. Well, you could technically use require here even better to some extent, but yeah. Anyway, this is one way to configure a Node.js app. This is one of the oldest one, and to be honest, a lot of systems already do that like this you could even replace this with um, and 
yeah something like this and this will still work and um, let's run this let's do that simple config config.json oh oh yeah i cannot use the import Ooh, hoo, hoo. Ha, ha. Ha, ha. funny so we need we need import here okay Now, this is one of the oddest things possible. Maybe not, maybe it will work. Let's try. Yeah, cool. Okay. Ooh, nice. And yeah, my module not found. Let's try that. Yeah. Oh, okay. If we do that, we need a wait. Okay. Well, mm, unexpected identifier console. Yes, perfect. Now you can see. Okay. To be honest, I would very much prefer a common JS word, but hey. Um, ways in which you can load a config file. You can even basically import, require, uh, import a JS file, do whatever you want with the system. This is typically common for all systems that are uh, built on uh, Webpack but for bundlers. Typically bundlers, you configure them with JavaScript, for example, okay? So, um, I don't know, did you try this code? Did you, did you use this system before in the past? Okay, anyway, reading a JSON file is, or a YAML file is, is one of the ways. Now, the, uh, what are the problems here? So this is, it seems very simple, but it's not as straightforward as you might think, because um, every time, you know, doing this at scale requires your operators to um, download all the important secrets and so on and so forth, create a config file, and then collocate it in the same disk, essentially, of your app. Now, this means that you're putting secrets on a file on a disk. And this is um, really tricky business if you if you if you if you if you consider it. So you should probably be very careful when you do this kind of stuff. And uh, um, you know, consider it. Okay. So okay. So point is, if you start storing files in uh, uh, on disk, this is very 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 secure these are going those secrets are going to be leaked so don't do that okay this seems very bad and i um you should probably not do this stuff so what do we do well there is an approach which is using environment variables and this is probably recommended by the old school 12 factor app system and um, there is also more stuff to say here but we'll talk a little bit about that later so what is an environment variable? Basically, it's something that you uh, you set before your process run and then you run your process and you can access within your process. Again, very Unix, very old school, very much uh, uh, reliable across operating systems and so on and so forth. So, yay, it's good. The, one of the problems with using environment variables is putting um, is polluting the code with environment variable access. A lot of detractors to using environment variables will use this pattern kind of everywhere, okay? Everywhere. I don't know, have you used this pattern? Have you polluted all the files with the configs? These happen quite a lot, to be honest. Yeah, I... So th that makes it very hard to know what are the environment variables that you need, okay? And it's very unclear it, how uh, uh, it's very unclear how you are. By the way, at Platformatic, we have the best swag, and we have even the bottle, branded bottles. So, 
Yeah, it's it's very tough. Okay, everybody pollutes all the things. Yeah, you see. Uh -huh. So, and the problem comes because the problem begins when you want to start figuring out what and the right things is and how to configure the system because um, it's you start going in deep in code search in github to find out all the places where an environment variable is used and then you found none and then you are you know what is happening here and turns out that that dependence is actually using a by a module and you is not in code search so ouch, you are being in trouble so this is essentially a big a little bit of a problem okay so the solution to that and is mentioned also in the chat here it's uh, um creating a config object and pass it around so you typically uh, parse your config okay create your config and then pass that config wherever it's used there is a flip approach which is all modules require the same file and sorry all modules require the same file however that does not really work because um we have um, um because then you cannot exp split your code okay and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, it's actually very important to to do this kind of things in this way so and also because this is completely reusable right you are configuring a low and you're passing the config around everywhere it's literally um you can literally take a low the low function and drop it somewhere else and everything is fine so the then the other option is to use the dot env environment well one of the things that you can do is use the dot env module and have it automatically load the dot env uh, file and everything works as um as expected okay kind of similar points works works very well you can use your uh, uh and by the way if you are if you like the dot and word you can even run it with um a, a dash dash and dash file from node this is new stuff and you have probably have not used it much but Node.js has dot .m support now and you can load it up in this way. So, works great. Now, it is a problem with environment variables, okay? And the environment variables are also insecure. Ah, I'm sorry, okay? I don't know if you are, uh, uh, if you have been following, but environment variables are also insecure because um, essentially when you spawn your uh, containers or your uh, you do some deployments you uh, are essentially storing those environment variables inside your kubernetes inside your docker and they typically end up on a disk and it's safer than using config files but still not considered really safe and a secure way of storing stuff so probably not what you should be doing okay Oh yeah, sorry. Let's 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 do a little bit of a demo, okay, of this. So uh, here we go. So let's go inside and M1. This is the system that I showed you before on the slides. We have the new parse args from uh, Node Util, so you can parse your uh, config command line arguments. And we have the low function, and we have a low here, which is does that. So what we can do. We can do a node. So we can say hello, ciao, node, command, name, his name. I don't remember anymore. Okay. Ooh. So it's its name. Yeah. Yeah, its name. Yay. No, not really what I wanted. Okay, hello ciao node command.js dash name Matteo. And you can see works because we can even flip it and say hello. Or hola. Oh, works as expected. Okay. 
Whoa, we are talking. We will be talking about convict. Okay, so this is essentially a, a, a very basic way of of doing things. Um, and uh, what you could do is uh, you could make it slightly better by using .env. And with .env, you have uh, a .env file. Oh, there's no .env file here. Oh yes, this is with. Uh, yeah. So we have this folder, so we go inside .env, and now here we have in command we are importing, as you can see, the .env, the .env environment. Sorry, kept open too many windows, and we have the import this that will uh, automatically load the file for us. So what we can do, we can do node command dash n. Matteo and works as we want to. You can even override it and oh sorry. Hello. And now works as expected. Great. Okay. Now what you could even do is if we go back and do um, file. Wait a second, I need the latest. Yeah. And file we need to specify it so it's in dot env dot env and file okay then we call the other library and yeah works as expected and we can uh, provide an M file and file are very common very useful for local development they are not useful for production usage so don't use M files in in production usage okay oh hi Emiliano how are you doing okay so um, this is a very good so we have covered this problem being uh, this is can still be um, is still be considered potentially unsafe uh, because um, once you are uh, scheduled the job and the task, those environment variables are in the scheduler too, and so on and so forth. So um, they can be leaked in one way or another. So, ouch. The solution to this to this problem are uh, using the secrets manager. I don't know if you ever use the Secret Manager. Uh, do you use the Secret Manager? Are anybody here that's already using Secret Manager? Yeah, okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So um, Secrets Manager are needed because they enhance security and means that secrets are encrypted at rest and are completely isolated. And you can do automated rotation of all your security and secrets. So imagine that you, ha you have a central place where um, you can essentially change your database connection string without needing to redeploy your app. This is actually very important for uh, quite a lot of um, uh, mission critical systems. So you want a place where you can change these kind of values without having to restart your systems and so on and so redeploy and so on and so forth. Sure. It's problematic. Then finally, you can maintain a uh, full OSS control and log of all of this. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit on how you do them with Fastify. What is Fastify? Well, Fastify is the web framework for Node that you should be using. So you're probably not using Fastify in some way or another. So please, um, well, I'm sorry for you if you're not using Fastify, but you should. You should be using Fastify. So. In Fastify, there is uh, uh, this bunch of modules that were developed by my friends at Nearform uh, that, that are maintained by my friend by Nearform. And it's a set of modules to help you deal with secrets managers. So uh, how do you do that? Well, you um, basically import the module, require the module, uh, and then it will uh, automatically work if the WS SDK is uh, uh, connected, okay? This is great, works very well, because then you can uh, essentially, when you do the await, okay, and you start loading things, you can read it up from that system. So um, that target system. So you can see here that you have your Fastify secret 
the Fastify secrets here from this is AWS and you specify the DB password and everything is completely, you know, um, almost uh, uh, agnostic. Um, this also works, for example, for uh, AshiCorp Vault. So you can even run your, these can even work across connecting to a Vault instance. <coughs> Happy year. Yeah, Happy is great. Um, probably as module similar to these ones. The approach is exactly the same. So, and the nicest part is that, you know, if you want to mock it, there is also um, a way to do, um, these are Fastify Secrets um, um, environment. So, which is completely unsafe, but works great for, for testing. So yeah, this is good. You can do AshiCorp Vault, you can do uh, GCP. Everybody loves GCP, right? Uh, until they don't shut this service down. So hopefully not, but you never know with Google. So, and then there is a AWS, uh, sorry, Azure Key Vault that uh, does uh, essentially still the same thing, more or less. So, um, this is really important, okay? So if you care about uh, security and access of your app, you want to store the secrets. Um, okay, this is a good question from the chat. So um, uh, 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 how reading the secrets from there avoid the redeploying? Are you fetching every time you use the secrets, the latest version? So, okay. Uh, so first of all, you... Uh, there are a few ways, okay? Redeploying, by redeploying means taking a new artifact and put it in production, okay? Changing a configuration value might require a restart, but that's not a redeploy. So, um, then the second point, it's uh, quite a lot of those systems allows for notifications, notification systems or polling and so on and so forth. Now, this sequence module do not implement it, but it's possible to build in case if you if you really need them. And uh, you can essentially uh, auto restart or self restart the app uh, uh, when something changes. So um, it's something that I have been looking to build inside uh, Platformatic. I've not got to do it yet. We are avid users of, uh, of Vault at this point. So it's... Uh, but anyway, you can use whatever you want, but hopefully it makes sense. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about one of my um, favorite topics, which is uh, validating environment variables. And a few of you have already mentioned this, which is env schema. And you you love env schema. Everybody loves env schema. I do. It's fantastic. And schema allow you to write a JSON schema and use that JSON schema. Oh, sorry, to parse um, your environment variables. That's it. Why is it a problem? You ask. Yes, it is. Let's show you. So, it is schema. Oh, this is not needed. Okay, it is the schema. It is a schema and you specify the syntax, which is JSON schema, which is not super friendly, but whatever. And it works the same as .env, but now if a law is not specified, it's uh, it will throw an error, okay? So if I do, for example, node env schema, it complains that it has required property hello. And if I specify hello and says ciao, it does the trick. This is great, okay? We can validate the environment variable, we can validate everything works fine, and everything makes sense. Now, what is the problem of this? Uh, how many of you are using TypeScript, folks? So, if you are using TypeScript, uh, this is problematic because this, all of this is not typed. Okay, this is really not typed. And there's no information to uh, move this type over. So. Also, it's not easy to write. So one way to make it easier to write, we can fix it by using something called Fluent JSON Schema. Fluent JSON Schema allows us to write this type of stuff. 
so and you can see here that you have uh, you take you create a, a, an object and then specify a, a, a low prop that's it so and we can try it and this is um, using the fluent api Yay! Okay. Hopefully it makes sense. Okay. Now we can... Uh, let's go back here. Yeah. Now, what we want to talk about is, is type box. Okay. And to be honest, I, I don't know how a lot of you prefer ZAD over type box because I am a little bit... Um, unimpressed so type box is um, despite being 031.8 it has a stunningly amount a high amount of downloads with 26 million weekly okay which is why what is happening here versus Zod is climbing over very slowly very quickly very quickly actually so that we'll talk about that in a second okay so in type box what you do so let's enter let's cd into the type box folder what we have what i've set it up is i created my schema and I'm exporting the type of my schema here in a config file, in a config.ts. And this allows me to say well, inside the low.ts, I can take the type of my config and then receive a config as a parameter. Now, this is the alternative of literally loading the config, importing the config from a file. However, if I would were to load the config from a given file, then everybody, every single file on my application will be importing that. That is tricky because um, in those cases, then everything is tied to that configuration be synchronously available, which more often than not is not the case. So I want to be able to boot my app every time I want in my system, which is um, what these allow me to do. Is actually very simple. I could define my object and then I get my config. How do you use it? Well, you need AJV. After you got your AJV, you uh, take the config schema, you compile the config schema, and then you can now cast safely the data. And now it's time to um, talk a little bit about the other library. So here, so here we have our hello.ts and our command. And we can even, something that is very, a lot of people don't know about Typebox is that you can actually use the Typebox compiler, which is a type compiler that essentially give us a, a compile function which you can use to check your data and essentially do the same thing as before. So you don't need AJV, essentially, if you want to do this kind of stuff. Cool. Now, one of the darling of the community these days is called Zod. It's a, a, a validator uh, built on mostly on TypeScript. Now, the usage is very simple. In fact, it you've you 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 do the exact same thing as you were doing with typebox it's more or less a 101 syntax you create your object and and you infer it and you get your type of it's the exact same syntax folks so if you love that you love typebox it's, the, it's identical there is only one difference which is i think is very important it is is that you can do these kind of things and pass it out okay So you can, oh yeah, let's go and dog. And you have your, your dot and then 
which you still do the same thing you import the type use the type and then you call confischema.parse for parsing the things yeah i'm providing the config on every call so um there is two options here to to do that so if you like if you something that i can do, i can i often do is to have something like this creating a function build that return a function and now you can see that i have wrapped my config so i can in command i can take build and now so the core idea here is uh, i want to be able to change my config without having to reload my application and because especially if you do testing or development uh, test driven development and so on you want to be able to load a chunk of your apps and not have to have any global state in your system so these actually remove that so hey this is great so essentially use this pattern this is probably my one of the sorry not this one use this pattern this is probably one of the best thing that you could do to make sure that your system is um scalable and can evolve over time so yeah just do that okay hopefully that makes some sense does it so again just to to be clear the alternative option here is if inside config what we would do is Okay, so we do that and instead we do, instead of importing the config, we import it directly. However, if we do that, which this was exactly the same, right? These words are exactly the same, is even less code. The problem is that in this system, you cannot do unit testing, okay? It's a good question from Franher. Uh, do you know uh, a way from an open API schema, get the type of dot schema to get the types? I, why would you need that? I, I, there is a way to get the, if using, if you're using Fastify, you can get, define your system, your API is in dot, and then map it to a JSON schema and then so on and so forth. I'll show you a demo runner of uh, how we do things in, in here, in the platformatic. So yeah, I, I let's uh, uh, Franer, hold on on that topic. I'm going to get to it after I finish with this stuff in the Q and A. Okay, so uh, hopefully that is, but you know, if you do that, then you need to mock that stuff. And if you mark, then uh, your systems becomes, your, your tests go super slowly, but also uh, they are more or less brittle. You can't really um, uh, break things apart correctly, you know, um, and uh, everybody's loading the full blown config and you don't know exactly which part of the system is used by whom. There is a question about what is your opinion using VM that run in new context and putting globally available things there as a sandbox? I would recommend against doing that. Stay away from it. I think it's um, it generically it works, but uh, it's it, your application becomes very brittle, so maybe not a good idea. The LF, I don't know how, how many of you have watched my talk about NodeEnv. Uh, maybe a few, maybe not. I'm going to go you a little bit of a run through of the topic. So you want to set node underscore env correctly. It's actually very important. Um, why? Well, because uh, 
the, you know, no damn is a major semantic misunderstanding of all the things. Okay, and uh, you know, it's it all come from Ruby on Rails as everything else. Okay, as good all good things in soft in modern software development comes from Ruby on Rails and Heraku. Um, uh, also, the uh, no damn comes from there. It actually comes from a variable called Rails AMP. Rails AMP can be can be set to development, test, or production by default, and you can add as many as you want. And uh, well, the problem here is what is development? What is intended as development here? And what is intended as production? And what's intended as test? So for Rails, uh, development is your machine. Tests is executed when running unit tests and production is our servers however you know this is not what everybody else thought uh, development means the developer machine but the every operator operation engineer develop on the planet thinks the development environment is actually a server where you deploy code to now this is a galactic issue and uh, of mis a big misunderstanding of the word, but it's actually very, very hard to do anything with it. Mostly because this means that um, you people will start using that NodeAmp, uh, RailsAmp, whatever variable to uh, you know identify actual real environments. Okay. And this becomes a very, very big problem. Great. So the problem is that people started putting this kind of code, this kind of stuff in their code. And they started putting uh, process.env.nodeenv equals 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 production and polluted half of the ecosystem with this. Okay. And you have behavior that only apps in production. Now, this will not be a problem if production means it's a server. Okay, all servers are production. Okay, this is what I'm trying to say. All servers are production. Yes, true, no, well, people started doing this. Okay, people started doing uh, no damn equals equals equal staging. And now we have a problem here. So, so here we go. So, and now we have a problem of, of this kind of stuff. So, you know, you don't do, you don't want to do this, okay, really. And this is a, um, a recipe for a, a big recipe, recipe for disaster. And because a lot of modules have a special behavior for node underscore amp. I don't know if you have seen this, this is actually everywhere, but it's, uh, uh, yeah, you really need to. Um, no, just set this to no damn to production and forget about it. Okay. All server environments needs to have that set. And you know the problem, as somebody has said to me recently, it's uh, um, using no damn to select your environment variable to select your environment x equal to um, uh, ordering a carbonara and not knowing if you'll be getting bacon or guanciale. And you know it's very much tricky, and but I like carbonara, so you should have a carbonara, a carbonara slide. And now the question comes from where did no damn come from? Okay, and you know where who added it? Well, the first thing to dispel is Node.js does not do anything on Node underscore damn. Node underscore damn is something that's only done in production, so. It's only in production in, in user land. It's done by modules on NPM. This was created by modules on NPM, not by anybody else. This is only a user land. Cons no pan noun carbonara. Yes, this is absolutely important. No pan noun carbonara. My first um, uh, uh, guess was that Express added it. This was how I recalled it. I checked, and in fact, there was a commit in Express that added this. However, I did check deeper and I found out that it was actually introduced inside Connect in 2010. Okay, consider that this was more or less not even a you know it was not even a year old when this was when this happened. And we have the Connect env that became node env. 
and now we have you can see where most of the um, uh, most of the problem comes from this okay so uh, and by the way team team caswell thank you you did a great job to build all the node community most of the problem here is how this was used afterwards so none of this here was to do the stuff in fact these become um even more problematic later on when we talked about bundlers and bundlers are uh, for example webpack tell us that a lot of libraries will uh, do things in if not they have been set to production to determine if uh, something should be included for example i think react does something different if not they have been set to production regarding to errors and the bug mode um i yeah there would be a youtube a recording on youtube yes and so probably you should do uh, your things here and okay let's talk a little bit about those because this is actually very interesting these are non-comprehensive list of libraries and i'm going to if you give me a, a module i will go through the module and review it with you because it's non-comprehensive so the first one that i'm going to talk to you about is adonis okay and adonis uh, does yeah this you you don't want to do this okay literally i'm sorry i don't know why this does that but this is please don't do this okay this is risky okay don't do it okay essentially you 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 don't want the a node env environment you don't want to require that the node environment is set and in fact it's it's even more um entrenched in the framework okay then there is next nest js which is one of the reasons why i don't like nest it's that it basically tells you here that there is a node env environment which is um yeah what you think it is okay so nah don't do this please okay set node env to production and forget about the rest please express is notable we may we talked about this now this module is probably one of the worst offenders it's called config and config is uh that don't use this this is probably one of the worst modules that you could be using which also downloaded one million times per week so i'm so sorry for it. this is a source of so many problems so with config you specify a config folder and um with a, for example a production file And then you select it by specifying the node env environment variable. And I am so sorry, folks. This module alone is the source of so many production incidents that you cannot imagine. Because absolutely, this will create the situation where you have um, modules that are doing special things if node env is set to production. And by default, this allows you to select your config based on the node app. And I'm so sorry. Even the darling of the community, TRPC, does some stuff on node amp. So, where is it? Here. Again. The only safe value for node env is production, folks. Okay. Don't set it to anything else. Now, a few things, folks, that we're asking about convict. So let me open convict. Apparently, convict allows you to specify a schema. But 
it does not do any special behavior on no then it seems so yeah this is good it's a good library okay hopefully it makes sense okay uh, I don't understand this Gabriel what do you mean by what pattern would you suggest for this kind of functionality libconfig or any other mvvar I don't understand the question sorry oh yeah the the generic problem is is not uh, uh, really switching uh, um, a config or another based on mvvar but really um, uh, uh, using no damn because it's been polluted across the ecosystem pretty much well it's still bad i would still recommend you to not do that because you can still end up with the same problem that no damn introduced so don't do that okay <laughs> turn on and off each feature independently there's no such thing as dev mode okay dev mode runs on your local machine and full stop so so um, let's talk a little bit. Let me show you a little bit how we handle configuration in, in, in Platformatic. Okay, so Platformatic does uh, a, a few things for you. Uh, Platformatic wants to help you remove a lot of the, what's called the undifferentiated heavy lifting uh, in building node apps. So it allows you to move very fast using, a, 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 using rails, uh, high speed uh, train from A to C and then you know, give you a nice uh, rental car, rent, rental electric car to move for the last few miles. So um, without leaving you uh, alone. Um, so it gives you the same flexibility of Node.js with a full blown um, uh, 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 framework. So let's let's try to take the take a look at how, how all of this works. So sorry, I need. Okay. Okay. So here we can create a, a, a new library with with platformatic and get in this folder yes um, no we're not deploying it okay so we are uh, creating our library installing things it takes npm install is always like slow like slow i'm sorry I don't know how to speed that up. Maybe leaving on the US is probably giving you a better NPM install. Local cache with Verdacho solves the problem. Yes, I am. I have a yeah, I feeling that I will need to do the Verdacho setup. So anyway, here is it. We have our PLT system. Okay, here uh, we can do PLT start to start the things. Oh, I already have one running. Where is it? My stuff running. Here we go. Okay. So we have our stuff running. We start it up. Here we go. And this is what it looks like. We have some basic routes, which is example here. And we can try this. And this would work and return some message. First thing that you want, if you want to add an environment variable, is uh, going into, oh, sorry, going in your M, M file and add an environment variable. So, for example, plt greeting, put hello, and you put in both your environment variable and your M sample. Don't forget to put into your sample files because if you put into the sample file, uh, you need. Um, you will need uh, people will scream at you because you, they don't know what value to put in there also document every secret that you need so when you're done that then you can put uh, 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 add it inside the options so you can do uh, you can add an option called greeting for example and then add a plt greeting no you see these brackets these brackets it's it's environment variable substitution so by doing that, we are allowing people to 
uh, you are allowing environment variables to come in and so on. Note this encapsulate flag here. Uh, encapsulate allows you it allows you to not have to wrap every single uh, plugin inside the Fastify plugin module. So that decorate, oh, sorry. So the decorate automate this decorate you see is automatically uh, moving forward. Okay. So um, um, so now we can use it and we can take this this thing like can copy it and just add a greeting dot js. Ah, sorry. What have I done? Okay, here we want to decorate with a say hello function. So build a little bit. Say hello. Name, it's great. And then we can use the option that we just specified. So, greeting. Okay. The, the, the encapsulate false allow us to decorate things in this module okay and use that in in another one in in another uh, plugin so otherwise it would be, be it would be constrained inside the current plugin and not available elsewhere so now we can add one more route so hello.js and we do we add an hello here and here we just uh, return fastify say hello Okay, from the query string, so we need to add some schema in the query string. So type object. This is a JSON schema. So I need to specify a few things. Um, using that will be uh, or type box will make it things way nicer here, and I can. So I can say um, require name, yes, and this is it. Yes, okay, and uh, this thing restarted, so now re retry it. And now things are working fine. As you can see in my curl, we can test it out and uh, let's uh, try to edit my config, my environment variable. Um, you can see that it restarted automatically and now the route is correct. Yes, Platformatic support ESM, everything works. Um, we keep uh, uh, all generated stuff in CommonJS mostly for uh, a backward compatibility to a few libraries in the ecosystem, but you can just uh, flip your uh, package JSON and everything works fine here. Um, uh, you can just specify type JS and, uh, and switch everything to ESM. Everything will work as you would expect it to work. It, it would. So. Um, it's just that the generated code is um, forcefully uh, common JS for backward compatibility with most of the ecosystem. Cool. Okay. So, um, and by the way, in, in Platformatic, it doesn't make much, it doesn't change much because even if you want to use a common JS um, a ESM file, you can always do a weight import here, okay, in a module inside the plugin. So it doesn't really matter, to be honest, it, where you do your imports and stuff. Uh, Fastify boots are synchronous anyway, so either do the loading stuff or not. This is identical. Cool. Okay. So um, we have done that. I showed you this. This seems very, um, it's very nice. Okay. Um, you can even use it in, in. You can even refresh your. We can even refresh our stuff here and uh, test it out with this. You can see that we have the uh, the name so and you can uh, load it up if you want to manage secrets you can manage secrets using the fastify modules so if you have um, um, any modules that are uh, um, if you have secrets with vault and so on you can use that we'll probably ship some more tight integration in the future um, however if you are doing um, if you are uh, using uh, our, our cloud to deploy stuff, we store all our secrets inside Vault. So if you do, so we have a command called Platformatic Deploy. And uh, 
and this um, you can specify a secrets file okay and where uh, you can load your um, uh, you can load secrets through this okay and by the way this also works from um, um, there is also a, a github action to match so you don't need to use this if you don't want to so this is, is the command so you can see that there is dash s secrets and you can specify your secrets or your environment files it's pretty great So um, there is, uh, there was one, let me finish the slides and then with more, more time for questions. So, um, oh, um, before we finish, there is, uh, I'm going to uh, another, do another masterclass um, uh, in January. So you can sign it up in this link. Scan it, it's a QR code. I promise I won't do bad things with you, with that. And then we have a, a, a half an hour more or less for questions. So there's a good question about what is the difference between Platformatic DB and Platformatic Service. Um, the difference is one has the database connected and the other one doesn't. And um, if you don't need the database, if you just need to do microservices and stuff and call other stuff, you can just use Platformatic Service. Otherwise, it's um, Platformatic DB adds all the database and authorization components to the topic. Okay, there was a few more questions around. Uh, one was about Dodd, that I need how to use Tidebox and Dodd and stuff, stuff like that. Okay, and then we have another one on uh, Platformatic. Yes, um, so, okay. Platformatic is Fastify on steroids with a lot of um, uh, set of stuff already built in. So you don't need to worry about auto reload, uh, development mode, uh, TypeScript compilation, it's all built in. It also has uh, tools for building clients. If you're building a microservice system, it does uh, all things that you would expect, uh, uh, you know, a starter kit or a template would do, but it's mostly, there is very little to generate. So it's mostly your code. Everything is configured and boxed inside nice and little reusable modules. Uh, the cloud, the, we have offered a product, a paid product. Like all of this is open source. You can just use it straight away. We have a, pay a couple of paid products. One is uh, our cloud. You can use it to deploy systems. It's uh, um, actually very easy. And we can actually show you if you want to. This is, you know, it's, uh, you can just do platformatic deploy on, on this and um, and uh, yeah, uh, and, and create a new application, and this will fail because there is no environment variable setup. Oh yeah, no, it's it's one save because it loads the local file. Here we go. So create new application. Here we go. Enter application name. Uh, something something. Sorry. Hello. And workspace. Let's call it prod and we support also um, live things and uh, now we are uploading stuff to the cloud so as you can see here we have created a new app and run the uh, selected organization and then it's being deployed takes a i don't know 30 seconds a minute something like that to to start a new app yes and you can see now this has been started and uh, here it is and now what you can do, this is deployed by the way, if you want to test it. This is the link. So we have deployed this and uh, in, I don't know, 40 seconds or something. Yes. Um, now, yes, you can, if you want this kind of uh, developer experience, contrary to Vercel or other providers, you, we offer it um, a, a cloud prem. So if you are a large enterprise and you want to use your own cloud to deploy, to have this level of developer experience, we allow uh, POGs to, um, uh, 
you can buy the on-prem product and essentially have your mini cloud there and have a nice, very nice um, developer experience to deploy your systems and manage them and operate them and all sorts of things. It's very, very keen. Works exactly the same, to be honest. It's the exact same code. So it will, it will just work. So there was um, clear, perfect, okay. So um, we also offer a support contract, comp uh, contrary to a lot of Fastify and other stuff. Uh, we have a support offering. So if you are using your stuff, consider buying the support contract so that we can help you in case there are bugs, but also uh, speed up your teams and support our work. So um, let me create a... Um, uh, let's do type box because that's what the one that I know best, but you can use to we do it with that too. Um, type box example. Okay, let's create a new platformatic app. Service here. Yes. Yes, I want to use TypeScript. I've joined the dark side. Okay. So installing dApps. Bye, Frosk. Thank you for joining. Bye. Here we go. Okay, so we have created our stuff. Now, uh, okay, so now if we do PLT start, you can see we have created a, a TypeScript project and you can see that it compiles stuff for us. Ooh, what did I do wrong? Oh, wait a second. These are the fun stuff about TypeScript. Like that. What is happening? Oh, I am sorry. I'm in the right, the wrong folder. Type box example. Here we go. Uh, yeah, sorry about this. I will probably need to do it again. Create platform. Wrong folder. Now we run this and first thing it does is compiling TypeScript and then it uh, uh, start our app. And this is the same default app as we saw before, but it's all built in, in TypeScript now. So if you see routes and plugins are, are now our old TS files. Great, okay. Um, something that we can use is uh, uh, the type provider system in Fastify. Here we go. And um, this is actually very useful. So let's say that we add this here. Oh, we need to add. So npm, oh, cd type box example. npm, I, uh, I need to copy this and that okay and now here if you want to have all the routes typed you can just use this in fact you can even specify it, what is it as a plugin so you can um, define it as, as, a, as a plugin type if you want to or you can just uh, 
grab it in this way and add okay we have basically rewritten this up what is oh it's a private repo sorry Here you go. It's now public. So cool. Okay. So we we have uh, uh, this now. Let's say that if you want to specify up a post, so you do fastify post example and you can specify the schema and then you specify the body and that's kind of it and now it start complaining heavily because you are not we had not done the stuff okay and now what you can do is uh, cost body request sorry not nice. cost hello you can do request body dot hello and wait did not pick it up ah yeah I know okay I need up okay up And ooh, here we go. I do I need a compile first? I don't think so. This is actually compiling. It's uh, funny enough. It is actually compiling. This is my ts config, and it's actually compiling. It's just not picking it up. Now it's picking it up. So you see the quest body dot low you can see now is part of the type box IntelliSense. So yep. Restarting the thing did the trick. So, and this is got, got compiled, everything is fine. And now you can try, we can try the things here and let's see open API docs and we have a post example. And as you can see, it automatically generates the stuff, okay? So now let's take a look at uh, platformatic dot. There is, there is probably a, a blog post or something. Here we go. We even have some some stuff in here. So um, here, oh, I did this four months ago. So funny enough, okay. And if you're using Zod, if you want to use Zod, you can definitely use Zod. And the only difference is you might want to do this because you need to specify a JSON schema transfer for Zod here to get the Swagger UI, but you can definitely get it working with, with Zod too. You need to set the validator compiler and set it as a compiler here, and everything would work as expected. And you can get your routes defined in Zod too. Using the exact same pattern, by the way, everything works as, as expected. So, does automatic type inference for schema entries in Fastify plugin as in types works out of the box only for top level plugin context? I think you will need to re specify things, yes. I, I, to be honest, I don't know if it works nested. Uh, this is a good, interesting question, and I don't know if it works nested. Um, yes, key clock is in the roadmap and to do list, so. 
it's uh, uh, we are currently busy preparing some launch and to serve some clients and unfortunately clients come first so we are uh, in uh, it's, it's on the roadmap though so the road is the roadmap public um, part of it is public um, other stuff are not um, we tend to do launch weeks and stuff and uh, uh, we prefer to announce things uh, at least my co-founder do um so yeah um but i can definitely so the all the all the issues on github are on the roadmap essentially it's mostly timing um what's the overhead to build an api with pltdb using scheme introspection for example i built uh i built a framework with a colleague that used fastify to set up a get only api the idea being contracts defined by the database schema. One is time to switch to PLTDB. Yeah, I think if you switch to PLTDB, you can mostly remove all the code in your app. The PL Platformatic DB has a concept called the schema lock that contains the metadata on the schema that has introspected. So that if you build that at an, on, on your developer machine and then you just run it on the, uh, on the cloud, it does not have to do all the introspection. And uh, this is great because you can even take Platformatic DB and run it on a Lambda. There's a guide. And uh, uh, so you can, uh, it starts immediately because it doesn't have to do all the introspection. The overhead of running that API, to be honest, I don't want to, to boost numbers that I, don't, that I don't have available. I think what we do is as fast, if not faster uh, than whatever you can roll out manually. There is very little overhead in anything that we do. Um, also, I think uh, it might be significantly be faster than what you can do with Prisma or a lot of other complex ORMs. So you might want to check it out. Is uh, Platformatic compatible with Apollo or Mercurius only? Yes, Platformatic is 100% compatible with Apollo. You can uh, uh, use uh, a po uh, platformatic DB with Apollo Federation. So yes, absolutely. Um, generically, Mercurius is compatible with Apollo. Then you can use Apollo Federation with Mercurius all the time. So yes, there is a flag to flip. So you just need to flag to flip a flag. Oh, can care to share your testing framework ideology? I don't know if you would call it ideology. But if we go back into the code, you can see that we also generate tests. And let's say, for example, this is the test and this is how you do it. I typically recommend to use node test these days and node assert. And you can essentially, let's add a test for say hello. Or let's, I'm um, sorry, it's, uh, oh, let's add a test for this new route, the example route, okay. So here we have the post example, okay. So test, post example so here you um here you have the inject and you do the post and you can specify the body and say um what did i put here i don't remember post example hello okay hello bar okay and yes now we can do node test oh uh, yeah it's node dist test routes root dot test and you can see this runs completely you can also do npm test here to run them all you can do um so does not test supports node and mocks absolutely so you can mock you can so you go node api you go to test test runner and mocking and uh, you can create your mocks here you can mock timers okay then i think there is modules um let me see there should be a way to mark modules or something like that mm. 
I will need to take a look, but it should be possible. Or at least I show you. Timer. I don't know. I think I saw it. I I I, I reviewed the PR. I don't know when it when it, when I got it. But you should be able to use uh, some uh, level of uh, of things to. Um, yeah, mocking. Yeah, that is the mark. Yeah, I don't know, but there, there was something. So, um, use Platformatic API call using Vtest? Well, it, it is basically the same thing you would do here. So, you need some sort of this kind of um, get server helper. So, here you um, take the config file, make some changes to your config file, and then call the build server from Platformatic service to get a server, and that's it. And you close when the server, when the test is done. You need to set up same things using Vtest. I, I probably running out of time now, so I can't show you, but it's uh, is there. Um, there is a question. Any insight on what to expect in Fastify V2? Uh, fa sorry, in Platformatic V2. Platformatic V2 is, uh, I think, hopefully not coming for a while. I hope to be able to ship stuff in Platformatic One for uh, for a few more months. So, um, and I'll try to run it as long as I can. So, I'm very hopeful on the core structure. So, I don't expect any big platformatic tool launchment, uh, launch. But we are going to launch something very nice and very, very, very nice, actually. Um, something very visual. Um, in, uh, on December 6th, uh, we will be in Paris and uh, um, we will be uh, launching and announcing a few new things so i will be very excited to um, demo it to all of you sooner rather than later at that time so um there is another question is it considered to be okay in fastify ecosystem to use uh, decorate in your test to override some of the injectables for a given test depending on its purpose on a simple di mechanism yes absolutely i use that technique all the time so uh, it's it's actually very common, especially if you want to test an individual plugin. You can test an individual plugin by you know um, loading the plugin on an empty Fastify system, ecosystem uh, application and then just injecting the stuff that you need. So amazing, folks! I don't know if there is anything uh, more to cover. Time to go. Bye, bye, bye.